Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. It was heavy and bitter in Sebastian's soul that day. No matter how hard he tried to chase the sad thoughts away, his memory kept reminding him that today was the 2nd of July. The 2nd of July. It was the anniversary of his marriage to Rokelia, a date he would never forget. Seven years ago was the most beautiful day of his life. It was then that he put a ring on his bride's finger and she became his beloved wife. They were so happy. Sebastian could not stop admiring his wife. Rokelia had always been beautiful. But that day, in her beautiful white dress, delicate veil, and a flower crown of white flowers decorating her dark hair, she was absolutely adorable. Sebastian could not resist kissing her again and again. And the tipsy guests laughed kindly at him for it. But he didn't care. He loved Rokelia more than life, and he vowed to himself that day that he would definitely make her happy. There were so many guests at the wedding, his friends and colleagues, Rokelia's relatives and friends. But there was no one from his family. His father refused to come to the wedding and forbade his mother to go. His parents never accepted their son's bride, a simple girl unworthy of their golden boy. But Sebastian was not worried at all. If they didn't want to come, that was their problem. Nothing and no one could ruin this day, the most important day of his life. Sebastian grew up in a wealthy family. He knew from the day he was born that whatever he wanted, he would get. He had the best clothes, the best toys, and the most professional teachers. His father was a famous politician, a well-known businessman, and a philanthropist. He was young, fit, and really handsome. He always attracted the attention of women. He had numerous girlfriends. His parents knew about it, but pretended that everything was fine in their family. That was their custom. Sebastian's mother didn't work, but she spent a lot of time doing charity work and posing for society magazines. She looked fantastic for her age thanks to plastic surgeons and the best beauty salons. Veronica often sparkled at all kinds of events and was flatteringly called a style icon, and other women only looked at her enviously and sighed heavily, looking at her expensive jewelry. Sebastian was their only son. Naturally, since he was a child, he knew he was a chosen one, different from the others. While his peers went to kindergarten, he spent time with nannies and tutors. English and French classes from the age of three, swimming pool, sports, and chess. Later, computer science, math, and economics classes. Instead of ordinary high school, he studied at a private, exclusive, language-oriented college. Most of the subjects there were taught in foreign languages, and the teachers were PhDs, associate professors, and other top professionals who had been poached from other schools, research institutes, and even universities. His classmates were also from wealthy families, pampered, spoiled, bragging to one another about their new gadgets and their father's fortune. Obviously, education in this college was paid, and quite expensive, even school uniforms cost over a thousand dollars. Only the privileged ones could attend this college. Even the children of the richest and most powerful people had to pass entrance exams and be interviewed by the principal. Rokelia had got into that school by accident. And she didn't study there from the beginning, but transferred only when she was one year away from graduation. Rokelia was a talented girl with excellent grades. She achieved excellent results at the regional Olympiad, winning first place there. The city authorities decided to encourage the girl by transferring her to this exclusive school, covering all expenses. As soon as the new girl entered the classroom, Sebastian immediately felt something unusual. No, he was not surprised by her beautiful appearance. There were many young beautiful classmates around him, well-groomed and stylish. But there was something about Rokelia that made her different. Something real, there was not a bit of falseness. She was natural and open-minded. And this despite the fact that the school uniform she wore was clearly not new. Apparently, someone had given them an old school uniform, and Rokelia had adjusted it to her size. Wow, said one of the jokesters as the class teacher introduced the new student. Where did such a milkmaid come from? From the village market? Roberto Gutierrez. The teacher scolded him. Stop it now. 
You should be ashamed of yourself for saying that. In our college, we don't judge people by their clothes. It's all about intelligence, kindness, and dignity. It would be better to judge by the clothes. Other classmates giggled. It's scary to be in the same room with that scarecrow. Sanson Maureen. The teacher raised her voice, stop it right now. During this whole quarrel, Rokelia remained silent. Her nervousness was shown only by the twitching of her lips and her eyelashes. She had such beautiful eyelashes. Sebastian could see it even from a distance, long as arrows, black as a crow's feather. Rokelia, dear, the teacher addressed her affectionately, you can choose any empty seat and sit down. The new girl hesitantly moved along the rows, but as she approached all the students who sat alone, they immediately put their backpacks and bags on the chair next to them, making it clear that the seat is taken. Don't sit next to me. The seat next to me is taken. Oh, just stay away from me, okay? I'm afraid I'll end up with some lice from you. Look, is it just me, or does it smell like manure in the classroom? E.W., the new girl brought the sense of her native village with her. Sebastian sat there, silently angry. He was pissed off by the stupid jokes and mockery of his classmates. They're laughing like stupid clowns. Grown-ups, but acting like little kids. But what pissed him off the most wasn't even his classmates, it was himself. It was his own weakness. He could have yelled now at his classmates for bullying the girl and shut their mouths. Sebastian was a popular student and had power among his classmates. They listened to him and respected him. But he never dared to defend the girl. He imagined for a moment how those morons would begin to mock him. They would shout, whistle, Hey, Ramirez, have you decided to try someone exotic, a commoner? Tell me later what it's like. Rokelia still walked confused between the rows of desks, not knowing where to sit. Her cheeks were red with humiliation, and her eyes were glistening, as if she was trying hard not to cry. Sebastian was sitting alone, too. He pulled himself together and was about to invite the girl to his desk, but Arturo Flores beat him to it. He waved at the new girl and called out, Hey, pretty girl, come sit with me, and smirked. Rokelia's face made it clear that she didn't really trust Flores. She cautiously looked at his smirk and defiant pose, noticing his cheeky tone. But she had no choice anyway, no one else wanted to sit with her. Or rather, no one but Sebastian. You can sit with me, he finally said, overcoming his shyness. But Arturo was indignant. Eh, no, my friend, you're too late. I invited her first. Right, Rokelia? And winked at the new girl. She decided to sit down next to Flores, trying not to meet anyone's eyes, and silently began to take her books out of her bag. But her bag caused another burst of laughter. Did you see that? She's definitely buying stuff at the village market. Arturo, be careful with her, or you might catch the plebeian disease. Maybe in a week, you'll sound like an old village milkmaid. Enough, that's enough. The teacher tapped her pen on the table again, trying to calm down the furious kids. It wasn't easy for the teachers to work in this school. Parents paid a lot of money for their children's education, so it was inappropriate to yell at them. The students always had a sense of power over their teachers and used it to their full advantage. They were rude, sassy, and, in general, often behaved in a disgusting manner. However, if the teacher succeeded in making them interested in their subject and presenting the material in an unusual and original way, then they listened attentively and, indeed, studied diligently. The level of education at that school was really excellent. So, let's start a new topic, the teacher said. Okay, guys, enough. Stop the noise. Open your exercise books and write down the title of the new topic. Sebastian glanced at the new girl who was sitting not far from him. He could see her delicate face, her attractive pink lips, and her still childishly rounded cheek. He didn't know what was so special about Rokelia that he was so attracted to her. But he couldn't take his eyes off her. The new girl couldn't make friends with anyone at this school. Well, that was quite predictable. 
All the rich kids turned away squeamishly when they saw her and ignored her. And if they even paid her any attention once in a while, it was even worse, because the bullying began immediately, vicious taunts, mockery. For example, during the break, Rokelia would often stand by the window and read some books. It was another reason for evil laughter. Look at this, she's reading. Did you see what book she has in her hands? She probably got it from her great-grandmother's the cover is about to tear off. This redneck probably doesn't even know what an e-book is. How would she know that? She doesn't even have a decent phone. Have you seen this museum artifact she sometimes uses to call? And in the cafeteria, when Rokelia was eating her meal, she was mocked all the time, too. Look at her, she knows how to handle cutlery. She must have hired a good manners tutor before she came to our school. No doubt, she's used to eating with her hands. Several times Rokelia, unable to endure such taunts, simply threw her fork on the table and ran out of the cafeteria. Sebastian's fists clenched involuntarily at such moments, but he still didn't dare to do something. He kept silent and despised himself for it. Still, one day he couldn't stand it anymore. It happened during choreography class when he overheard a conversation among the boys in the changing room. So, Arturo? A classmate asked him in a friendly way. Aren't you tired of sitting at the same table with your beggar? Flora smiled lazily. Come on, actually, she looks good enough. Actually, yes, someone unexpectedly supported him. Did you see her today during choreography class in a tank top and shorts? She's got a great body. Yeah, Arturo smiled, and then he sort of imitated a large attractive woman's breasts with his hands in the air. Her body is just fine. Did you get a chance to touch this body? His classmates teased him. Or did you already examine it inside out? Do I have to? Arturo grinned smugly. I don't like these inexperienced shy girls. It's more work and less pleasure. I don't think she even likes you, someone hesitated. You would hardly succeed with her. Floris' eyebrows went up. What, he said. Do you really think I can't seduce that stupid girl? Do you think she'll refuse me? Should we bet on it? I'll bet you $100 that you can't seduce her. $100? Floris wrinkled his nose in contempt. I wouldn't even get out of bed in the morning for that kind of money. All right, how about a $500 bet? Well, there's more to think about, Arturo hesitated. So, deal? Well, it's just... Arturo hesitated. Just tell me that you're scared. Scared? His friend teased him. Me? Scared? Flores became more enthusiastic. All right, no problem. How much time do I have? Two weeks, they suggested, but only if it's for real. So that she really falls in love with you and chases you like a little dog. Rokelia will be drooling all over me, Arturo said confidently. And that was the moment when Sebastian couldn't take it anymore. Until then, he had simply listened to the conversation, but now he walked up to the company and said clearly and strictly as if he was hammering every word into Flora's head. Don't even try to hurt her, or I'll beat you so bad that you'll be in a wheelchair. Arturo's eyes widened. What? Are you talking to me? Sebastian nodded grimly. To you. If you hurt Rokelia, you'll have to deal with me. Arturo rounded his eyes in exaggerated horror. Oh, how scary. I'm going to pee my pants. And yet, there was uncertainty in his voice and look. Sebastian's father was a very famous and powerful man, and no one wanted to get into trouble by messing with his son. Relax, Sebastian, Arturo said in a different, calmer, and friendlier tone. Why do you even care about it? Or do you want to try the new girl too? Well, excuse me, brother, you're second in line. How do you feel about the product, which was already in use? I warned you, Sebastian repeated coldly. If you do this, you'll regret it later. I won't tell you twice. He turned around abruptly, 
picked up his backpack, and left the changing room. From the edge of his ear, he heard one of the boys muttered in surprise. What's the matter with him? It's like he's not himself. From that day on, he and Floris became enemies. Arturo ignored Sebastian's warning and began to court the new girl. He started with something small, say something nice to her, move a chair to her, or offer her a seat in the cafeteria next to him. Rokelia had no idea what was going on and felt very uncomfortable. None of the girls in the school knew about the bet, only the boys, so the girls were puzzled. Arturo, what happened to you? Do you want something exotic? E.W., we certainly didn't expect that from you. But Arturo just giggled and continued to do his job. In the cafeteria, he would always sit next to Rokelia, tenderly courting her, bringing her a tray of food, bread, and napkins. Rokelia didn't know where to hide from his attention, but she couldn't openly tell him to go to hell. In the check room, Floris handed Rokelia her coat and gallantly helped her put it on, trying to ignore the laughter around them. He kept trying to persuade Rokelia to get into his car, a fancy sports car his father had given him for his 18th birthday. But Rokelia repeatedly refused such an attractive offer and always rushed to the bus stop. Rokelia, my sunshine, Floris persuaded her in his softest voice, my car will get you there in just 10 minutes. Do you really want to take an hour's bus ride? Let me drive you. No, thank you, Rokelia said firmly, I can get there myself. You don't have to take me anywhere. The days flew by quickly. The time given to Arturo to seduce the stubborn girl was running out, and he was becoming visibly nervous. And it wasn't because he didn't want to give away $500. More than anything, he was afraid that his reputation as the local Don Juan and Casanova would be damaged. He was angry, and he was losing control, and Sebastian was secretly happy that nothing was working out for him with Rokelia. There were only two days left, and Floris decided to act more brutally and aggressively. After school, he waited for Rokelia to come down the steps of the school porch and pulled her by the sleeve. Come on, stop being so shy. Don't be so unfriendly. Let's go. I told you. I'll drive you home. Rokelia went pale and snatched her hand away. No, thank you. She answered flatly, as always. I'll get home on my own. Her voice trembled a little, and that was the only thing that revealed her nervousness. Other than that, she seemed perfectly calm. But Arturo couldn't take it anymore. He went crazy and almost barked. Why the hell are you acting like a queen? Anyone else would die of happiness if I offered a ride. This may be your only chance to ride in such an expensive car. You will never have that kind of happiness again. Well, he shouldn't have said that. However, Rokelia didn't even seem surprised. I heard you, Arturo, she said calmly. I'm not going anywhere with you, ever. Do you understand? Get in the car, now. Arturo was completely out of control. He pushed her sharply toward his car. Rokelia staggered but managed to stand on her feet. At this point, Sebastian could not stand it anymore, jumping down from the porch from where he was watching the scene and punched Floris in the face. Rokelia, who had not expected any help, cried out in fright. Arturo howled and bent over in pain, touching his nose. Blood was streaming through his fingers. Have you lost your mind, Ramirez? He wheezed. Are you tired of living? You are tired of living, Sebastian answered calmly. I warned you. Flores tried to straighten up and swung for a counterattack. But Sebastian deftly moved to the side and struck him again, this time somewhere in the solar plexus area. Arturo bent over again and wheezed. People had already rushed over to them. Are you guys crazy? The schoolmates asked in shock. What the hell happened? Sebastian ignored all these questions and turned to Rokelia, who was still standing a little away, watching the fight with horror in her eyes. Rokelia, come on, I'll take you home, he said calmly, though he wasn't even sure she wouldn't tell him to go to hell, just as she had done to Arturo Flores all these days. But to his great surprise, she agreed. 
Under the shocked, confused gazes of their schoolmates and the hateful gaze of Arturo, Sebastian took Rokilia by the hand and led her to his car. From that day on, they were never apart. They were together everywhere at school until the afternoon, and then they went for a walk in the park or to the cinema. Or they would just drive around the city in his car until late at night, when Sebastian regretfully drove Rokilia home and they said goodbye for the whole night. See you tomorrow. The separation seemed unbearable to them. He was doing his homework at night and his parents scolded him for neglecting his studies. Son, with my connections and my power, you can get into any university you want, his father told him. But still, I wish you hadn't graduated from high school as a complete moron. His parents quickly realized what was the reason for their son's strange behavior. Sebastian had fallen in love. It can happen to anyone. Especially since his school really was attended by the best of the best, the richest, most famous, and most beautiful girls. However, when they found out that Sebastian's chosen one was some simple girl, they were furious. A terrible scandal broke out at home. Son, do you want to drive me to my grave? Mother cried. And make a fool of your father and mother? Her father supported her. Sebastian shrugged his shoulders in bewilderment. Why do you care? It's my life, my relationship, and my girlfriend. And you don't even know her. She's a wonderful girl, very smart, well-read, and kind. I don't want to hear anything about that low-class girl. His mother retorted. Mom, since when did you become so arrogant? Sebastian sighed. How can you say that about a girl you don't know personally? Right. Dad said suddenly. Sebastian, invite your girlfriend to our place for dinner. We can get to know her and find out what kind of person she is. Sebastian thought his father wanted to reconcile and was very happy. Then I'll invite her this Saturday, okay? Okay, Dad nodded. Go ahead. At first, Rokilia didn't want to go, as if she felt what a disaster this unfortunate dinner would be for her. However, Sebastian used all his eloquence to convince her. My parents are wonderful, trust me, he kept repeating enthusiastically. You will find a common language with them. And if, if you don't like anything, we'll leave right away. Rokilia looked up at him with huge, frightened eyes. Do you promise? She quietly clarified. Sebastian nodded. I swear. But his hopes for the best were wasted. As soon as Rokilia crossed the threshold of the Ramirez family home, the parents' faces were immediately petrified. They could immediately tell the social status of their guest and the financial situation of her family. This girl was not equal to their son and therefore simply wasn't suitable for him. Poor Rokilia tried so hard, she put on her best dress, which she had made herself, and even bought new shoes for the occasion. But all her efforts were in vain. At dinner, his parents stared at her so viciously that Rokilia even lost her appetite. Moreover, his mother constantly provoked the girl. For example, she asked, Try the warm beef salad, Rokilia. I guess you've never eaten good beef in your life? No, you're wrong, poor Rokilia answered, turning pale, then red, then pale again. Really? Oh, my goodness. The mother pretended to be surprised. Perhaps you ate oysters, too? No. Um, only crab sticks, said Rokilia, stammering with nervousness. There was a moment of silence at the table, and then the parents looked at each other expressively and rolled their eyes. Sebastian was ashamed of his parents' behavior. He tried to ease the tension, to avoid dangerous topics, but he could still see that Rokilia felt terribly uncomfortable. She was red like a tomato, her eyes downcast, and she barely ate anything, only stirring the salads with her fork, pretending to eat. Finally, Veronica said in an innocent voice, Rokilia, probably you don't know this, but in a decent society, it is appropriate to eat a salad with a knife and fork. I don't see a knife in your hand. Thank you, she said quietly. I'm full and I don't want to eat anymore. We don't talk like that in a civilized society. 
You have to put your fork and knife in a certain position, making it clear that your meal is over, Sebastian's mother pursed her lips. Finally, Sebastian couldn't stand it anymore and stood up abruptly from the table. That's it, we are full. Thank you for dinner. Rokelia, let's get out of here. And pulled the completely confused girl with him. Then she cried for a long time in his car, and he tried to calm her down, gently brushing tears from her cheeks. Don't cry, darling, he tried to comfort her. I don't give a damn what they think. They looked at me like I was some kind of trash, Rokelia sobbed. I've never been so ashamed in my life. You're not trash. After all, I chose you, not them. And I'm fine with everything, I. I love you, Sebastian added. It was his first confession, and Rokelia fell silent in an instant. Her eyes opened wide. She was speechless. Love me? Really? She mumbled incredulously. I love you very much and always will, until death. He swore. Unfortunately, he didn't specify an until whose death he will love her. His parents gave Sebastian an ultimatum, either he would break up with Rokelia, or they would deprive him of any kind of support, both moral and material. Sebastian did not hesitate to choose the second option. And don't count on me to help you get into university. His father yelled. You'll go to the army after all. Well, I'm okay with that, Sebastian grumbled, but I would never give up Rokelia, no matter what. His father turned red with rage and stamped his feet. You are no longer my son. Sebastian nodded. As you wish. Just don't forget that it was your decision, not mine. You decided to give up on me. Unlike Sebastian's father and mother, Rokelia's parents welcomed him warmly, cautiously at first, but without any hostility. When they found out that the boy had been kicked out of the house, they immediately helped him with accommodation they offered him to live in Rokelia's grandmother's apartment. The grandmother had died long ago and the apartment was empty. His father's predictions that his son would fail to get into university and have to join the army did not come true. Sebastian brilliantly graduated from a prestigious school and entered one of the best universities in the country without any support from his parents. Rokelia also entered a university, but not as prestigious, but she obtained a scholarship from the government. Sebastian quickly found a part-time job at a software company. He was pretty good with computers, and by the age of 18 had already proven himself as a good computer expert. He studied, earned money, and spent his spare time with Rokelia. Wait a little longer, he told her, I'll save some money, and we'll throw a beautiful wedding party. Sebastian, Rokelia told him one day, my mom and dad are willing to help us financially with the wedding. They will pay for everything it will be their gift to us. But he shook his head. No, they are wonderful people, but I won't take a penny from them. I will provide for my family on my own, and I promise you that you will not need anything. He never saw his parents again. His mother sometimes tried to call him secretly from his father to ask how he was doing and if he needed anything. But every time Sebastian firmly replied that he didn't need anything from them. He had disgraced the honor of the noble aristocratic Ramirez family and had no right to be called their son, so it was better to let them forget his name altogether. He had no regrets that he had made such a difficult choice and had chosen Rokelia. He was truly happy with her. The only thing that bothered him a little was Arturo Flores. The same former classmate he had punched in the face for harassing Rokelia. It turned out that Flores enrolled at the same university where Rokelia studied. It was strange, with his father's connections he could have chosen any university. Not as modest as this one. Is he bothering you? Sebastian asked jealously. Does he insult you? Does he harass you? No, no, Rokelia assured him. He doesn't talk to me at all. He doesn't even say hello. He just looks at me strangely sometimes. These strange looks worried Sebastian. But Arturo never once even approached her in all five years of study. Eventually, Sebastian calmed down. Maybe Arturo's appearance at the same university really was just a coincidence. Right after graduation, they got married. 
Sebastian was already a co-owner of a software company and was making good money. The wedding was fantastic, just as they had always dreamed it would be. Sebastian could not believe that the gentle beauty in the snow white dress was his wife. He could not stop looking at her, could not breathe without her. About a year after the wedding, their daughter Adelaida, or as her grandparents affectionately called her, Ada, was born. Sebastian felt that the cup of his happiness was filled to the brim. And then tragedy happened, turning his whole life upside down. That day, Rokelia called a cab to go to her parents' house to pick up Ada. She took the baby to her parents for the weekend Ada was still a baby, but she didn't cause any trouble. She ate on schedule, slept, babbled something, and never cried in vain. Dream child. Sebastian joked more than once that if all the babies were as perfect as their Ada, he wouldn't mind having three or four more. Rokeliev called a cab and left, but she never made it to her parents' house, and she never showed up at home again. She just disappeared without a trace. Sebastian never thought that such a thing could happen to them, to their family. It was wild. Was it possible for a person to disappear in the daytime? Could people disappear into thin air? He couldn't believe it, however, it had happened. Sebastian was going crazy, pacing back and forth in the house and growling like a wild animal. He was ready to gnaw at the walls out of helplessness and uncertainty. The policeman tiredly promised him that he would do everything possible. But he did not seem to care at all about the case and was in a hurry to close the case. Colleagues, friends, and even Rokelia's parents urged Sebastian to pull himself together and calm down. At first, they assured him that Rokelia would surely be found very soon and everything would be fine again. Then, when a few weeks had passed, they began to speak differently. They said he had to accept it, accept everything as it was, and get on with his life. But he wasn't going to accept it. Sebastian needed to see his Rokelia, alive or dead. Even if dead, at least he had to bury her properly. If it hadn't been for little Ada, he would kill himself. There was simply no point in living any longer without Rokelia's shining eyes, her smile, and the wonderful smell of her hair. And soon they fished out a purse with her papers in the city river. The police decided the young woman had drowned and closed the case. The divers tried to find her body, but they found nothing. Ever since then, Sebastian felt as if he had died, along with his beloved. Ada was the only person who could keep him from drowning. She forced him not to give up and go on with his life for the sake of his daughter. Sebastian's parents, upon learning of his misfortune, even came to see him after years of silence. They expressed fake condolences and hinted that even though they had a negative attitude toward Rokelia, they did not have anything against their granddaughter and they even wanted to meet her. Sebastian was so furious that he almost threw them down the stairs. But he still had a warm, family relationship with Rokelia's parents. He continued to visit them often and took Ada with him. They adored their granddaughter and always said she reminded them so much of Rokelia. When Sebastian was in Rokelia's parents' house, it was as if he could feel his wife's presence. There were pictures of her everywhere. There were still some of her dresses in the closet. Even her old toys were still there. Her parents had not thrown anything away in memory of their daughter. Gradually, the pain dulled. Sebastian didn't forget about Rokelia, but little by little he began to realize that life went on. It was an empty, worthless life without Rokelia, but he still had to live. A year after Rokelia died, Sebastian met Arturo Flores at the store. Suddenly, he thought that their past quarrels and disagreements were so silly. They had fought so much because of the girl. They were such fools. Hello, Arturo. He was the first to walk up to Flores and held out his hand. Do you recognize me? But the former classmate was acting strangely. When he saw Sebastian, he changed his face and moved away as if he had seen a ghost. Are you okay? Sebastian was confused. But Flores did not say a word to him. He left his food cart in the middle of the store and ran away. Sebastian just stared at him in a daze, unable to understand what was happening. Did Flora still hate him so much that he couldn't even be in the same store with him? No, that's ridiculous. 
He looked into Arturo's cart, and besides the groceries, he found a few female items, hand cream, lipstick, facial scrub, and shampoo. Shrugging his shoulders again, Sebastian continued shopping and soon forgot about the strange episode. Time went on. Five years had passed since Rokelia died. Ada grew up making her father and grandparents really happy. She was a pretty and incredibly intelligent little girl, just as smart as her mother. Teachers in kindergarten could not stop praising her. She dances, sings, and draws better than anyone in the kindergarten. She was always given the leading parts in plays, and Sebastian, sitting in the front row among the mothers, clapped his hands proudly as he watched his little artist do her best. He never got married again, and he never even got into a relationship with anyone. He just couldn't imagine having anyone but Rokelia by his side. In the meantime, he was being hunted by the women around him. Girls were crazy about him. He was intelligent, smart, handsome, and rich. The fact that he had a daughter did not scare away potential candidates for marriage. And the fact that Sebastian was a widower even added a certain flavor of romantic drama to his image. Ada's sixth birthday was coming up. Sebastian bustled about organizing a party for his little girl. He ordered a lot of presents and rented a room in a children's cafe. He took care of the invitations, animators, balloons, and fireworks. And still, every time it turned out that he forgot something and had to rush to the store and buy something else for the holiday. A couple of days before the party, Sebastian realized that he had forgotten almost the most important thing, the candles for the cake. Six candles for his little princess to blow them out and make a wish. What kind of wish was she going to make? Sebastian quickly put his jacket on and ran out of the house. The store was right next to the house. A homeless woman was sitting on the porch of the store. She lowered her head and put her arms around her shoulders. She must have been cold. After all, she was dressed only in some light sundress, even still quite clean, not like the usual clothing of homeless people. Maybe she had stolen these clothes somewhere? When Sebastian passed the homeless woman, he slowed down for some reason. He suddenly thought there was something oddly familiar about her posture and her skinny arms. He couldn't see her face, it was lowered. Besides, her face was hidden by her tangled dark hair. Her hair. It looked strangely familiar. Sebastian's heart raced. Excuse me, he called in a hoarse voice. Do you, do you need any help? The homeless woman raised her head and their eyes met. Sebastian felt his heart about to burst out of his chest. The woman looked at him with huge, familiar eyes. Rokelia. At first, he thought he had lost his mind or that he was just dreaming. But soon he would wake up and the dream would disappear. It had happened to him many times before. Rokelia had come to him in his dreams and looked so alive, so real, that he woke up happy and stayed in that state for some time after waking up. And then reality would ruthlessly strike him and stab him in the heart, and then he would tremble in silent sobs. Now, thinking he was just dreaming, Sebastian shook his head and blinked a few times. Then he squeezed his eyes shut, hoping the illusion would dissipate. But when he opened his eyes, the illusion had not disappeared. His wife was still in front of him. Rokelia. Sebastian exhaled, still afraid to believe it. Rokelia. My love. The homeless woman raised her eyebrows in bewilderment. She didn't recognize him at all. She was looking at him as if he were a stranger. You are mistaken, she said. I am not Rokelia. I am Felicia. But her voice was like Rokelia's. It was so familiar, so dear to him. The thoughts rushed frantically through Sebastian's head. Don't you recognize me? He asked, still not fully believing his happiness and the fact that he had found Rokelia. I am your husband, Sebastian. At these words, for some reason, the homeless woman recoiled in fear. Husband? She asked again in a hysterical tone. Husband? No, thank you. I have had enough of husbands. I don't trust any of you anymore. She tried to get up and run away, but Sebastian grabbed her arm. 
That familiar touch burned the man again with a flash of memory. It turned out he still remembered how her skin felt, how warm and smooth and soft it was. Wait, he pleaded. I won't hurt you. Let me go, or I will scream, the homeless woman warned, but somehow uncertainly. Sebastian had already realized that Rokelia did not recognize him. He was so confused that he could no longer tell for sure if it was really his wife. Could he really be mistaken? But was it possible? It was her voice, the voice of his beloved wife. The color of her skin, her facial expressions, her voice, her movements, and even her gaze could he possibly be mistaken? Feverishly taking his phone out of his pocket, Sebastian opened the gallery and began to scroll through the old pictures. Here, look, without thinking, he gave the homeless woman his phone. It's you and me, our wedding. Or one of us has gone insane. She stared at the wedding photo in confusion. She studied her own face for a long time, then Sebastian's face. She shifted her gaze from the phone screen to him and back again. Yes, she murmured at a loss. It really does look like you. And this. I guess it really is me. Rokelia, honey, we all thought you were dead. Sebastian spoke heavily, feeling the sobs coming to his throat. I almost died of grief. And you, you're alive. I always knew it. I believed it. I sensed it. Sebastian was overwhelmed with emotion. More than anything else, he wanted to squeeze his wife in his arms, touch her hair, kiss her soft lips. He wanted to scream with joy, hurrah. I found her. I finally found her. But he was afraid of embarrassing her with his behavior. Rokelia was looking at him incredulously and frightened. So, Sebastian asked when he had calmed down, don't you remember me at all? Nothing of our old life either? Nothing, she whispered, her eyes wide open. You were gone for five years. Five horrible, unbearable, endlessly long years. Yes, Rokelia answered in a cold and different voice. Five years. Finally, he dared to take her by the hands. His heart clenched, the touch of her thin tender fingers was so familiar. Jesus, my love, where have you been all these years? He asked, almost in despair. Rokelia turned away, was quiet for a moment, and then answered very quietly. In hell. Sebastian's appearance with Rokelia caused a furor. His father-in-law and mother-in-law were just at his house playing with little Ada. Rokelia, sweetheart. Her mother cried out, turning pale. Rokelia jerked from the cry as if struck. The shocked father stood up from the couch and wheezed. Rokelia, alive? Only Ada, who had almost no memory of her mother, froze frightened, not knowing how to react. Her parents rushed to Rokelia to embrace her, but Sebastian stopped them with a gesture. Don't, you might scare her. What is going on? Rokelia's mother exhaled. Why is my daughter so strange? Rokelia really did look and act strange. She looked at all these people and hid in a corner of the room in horror as if she was afraid of being hit. I found her outside the store, Sebastian explained. But I think she has amnesia, memory loss. She doesn't remember anything or any one of us. What do you mean, doesn't remember anyone? Her mother gasped and looked pleadingly at Rokelia. My dear, don't you recognize me? Rokelia shook her head. No, I'm sorry. Sebastian's mother-in-law immediately cried. Please stop crying. Rokelia's father got angry. That's not the main thing. The main thing is that our daughter is alive. We couldn't even dream of that. He's right, Sebastian confirmed. Amnesia can be cured. Even if not. Still, we're together again. Isn't that a blessing? Now Rokelia needs to come to her senses, get a shower, and eat something. And then we'll take her straight to the doctor. Who is it? Rokelia suddenly asked, pointing her finger at Ada. The little girl was still standing motionless, watching her guest in fascination. This is our daughter, Adelaida, Sebastian said. But we all just call her Ada. 
and that is what you used to call her. Daughter? Rokelia whispered in shock. But I... I don't have children. You have a daughter, Sebastian shook his head. You loved her very much when you were with us. Is that my mother? Ada asked in a trembling voice. Yes, my princess, Sebastian nodded. It is your mother. We lost her once, but now we've found her. She doesn't remember you yet, but she will remember you soon. We all hope so. He didn't have time to finish the sentence. Ada, with all her childish spontaneity, rushed to Rokelia and put her arms around her knees tightly, hugging her mother with her whole body. Mommy! She cried. My dear mommy, I have waited so long for you. Sebastian's heart ached and a lump came to his throat. No matter how hard he tried to be a good, almost perfect father to Ada, no one could replace the girl's mother. Rokelia stood completely dumbfounded, stroking the little girl's hair in confusion. Her eyes also glittered, as if she were about to cry. Ada. Sebastian intervened. Mom needs to recover a little, to take a hot bath. With cherry bubble bath? The little girl sobbed and turned her gaze to Rokelia. You can take my bubble bath, it smells really good, like berries. I don't let anyone use it, not even daddy. But you can use it. Rokelia blinked and smiled with trembling lips. Thank you, Ada. Let's go, Sebastian pulled his wife with him. I'll show you where the bathroom is and give you something to change into. I. His voice cracked. I didn't throw out any of your clothes, as if I felt you might still need them. He brought a large, soft towel for her and Rokelia's favorite robe with lilies. Seeing her husband in the mirror, Rokelia jerked frightenedly away from him, almost shattering the mirror, and automatically put her hand to her face, as if to defend herself from an attack. My God, what has happened to you? Sebastian shook his head. Don't be afraid of me, Rokelia. I swear by everything I have, I would never do anything bad to you or hurt you in any way. He also used to say that, she whispered helplessly. Sebastian frowned. Who? My husband. He is the most cruel man on earth. Sebastian could get nothing more out of her. What husband? Where had he come from? And how dare he call himself Rokelia's husband? Why did he lie to her so shamelessly? But, in response to all the questions, she only got even more frightened and went completely silent. Apparently, remembering all that she had been through was painful. Sebastian realized that he could only do more harm with his pressure and stopped asking questions for a while. After Rokelia took a bath, ate, and relaxed a little, he suggested going to the doctor. After hesitating, she agreed. If anything seems uncomfortable, tell me right away. Sebastian warned. We will not do anything against your will. If you're not ready to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with a psychologist, we can wait for a while. No, I'm quite ready, Rokelia said confidently. I want to know what happened to me. Who and why did this to me? I want to remember who I am. To remember you and Ada. She turned her gaze to her daughter. Sebastian cheered her up. Let's hope the doctors can help us. He took Rokelia to the best private clinic. There they could get services from all kinds of specialists, not only in the field of psychology, but also take all kinds of tests and undergo the required examinations. Sebastian needed to make sure that Rokelia was all right, at least physically. The results of the tests were quite encouraging. Despite the amnesia, Rokelia's overall condition could be characterized as satisfactory. A slight emaciation indicated that she had not eaten very well in recent weeks. But, in general, it was clear that she had lived well, had not starved, and had not been physically abused all these years. But in terms of her mental health, things were much more serious. The psychologist had a long private talk with Sebastian's wife, while her husband couldn't find peace and was pacing back and forth in the hallway, wondering what was going on there. The doctor told Sebastian to leave the room, otherwise, his wife would feel vulnerable and wouldn't be able to say all the things she would want to say. 
But the therapist also said that if he wanted, Sebastian could watch a record of their conversation later. Sebastian had no choice and agreed. Sebastian, grudgingly, agreed. He really wanted to find out what had happened to Rokelia and what she remembered as soon as possible, but hurrying was not the right thing to do. It would only make things worse. Rokelia walked out of the office, staggering with weakness. Without Sebastian running up to her and taking her under her arm right away, she would probably have fallen. Did you find out anything? Sebastian asked the psychologist in a stressed voice. He handed him a flash drive with a video of the conversation. Just watch it. I think it smells like a criminal case. It looks like your wife was kidnapped and held against her will. Maybe if you watch the video you will understand who did that. In any case, I would advise you to go to the police. Sebastian promised that he would certainly do so. But first, he needed to hear everything for himself. They returned home exhausted. It had been a difficult and stressful day, difficult for everyone. Rokelia refused to eat dinner and asked permission to go to bed. Sebastian made a bed for her in their matrimonial bedroom, promising not to disturb her and that he would go to sleep in the living room. Naturally, more than anything, he wanted to fall asleep cuddled up with her, feeling the scent of her hair, the smoothness of her skin. But he knew he was in too much of a hurry. In fact, he was now just a stranger to Rokelia. He knew he shouldn't try to get into bed with her now. When his wife and daughter had gone to bed and the house was quiet, Sebastian took his headphones, his laptop, and that flash drive and went into the kitchen. He didn't want anyone to disturb him. Staring at the screen and almost not breathing, he listened to his wife's confession. In a weak voice, as if reading a documentary chronicle, Rokelia told how she lived and where she had been all these five years. I don't know what had happened to me before or what triggered the amnesia. I woke up in a strange room, in a strange house. There was a man sitting next to my bed, holding my hand, and I asked him who he was. He was very surprised and asked me if I recognized him. I told him I had never seen him before in my life. Then he asked me about my name. That's when I realized I didn't remember anything. What happened next? The psychologist's calm voice sounded. This man told me that he was my husband, that his name was Gilberto, and that we had been married for almost 10 years since graduation. And you believed him? The psychologist asked. No, Rokelia answered after a hesitation. I didn't want to believe him. Why not? He was unpleasant to me. Something about him made me nervous. He didn't act like someone who'd lived with me for years. It was as if he didn't know how to behave with me. I told him my doubts, and he said that the memory loss just made me a little different and he was having a hard time getting used to it. But he, he actually looked and acted very suspicious. How exactly? The psychologist clarified. Well, he didn't really know anything about me. He couldn't tell me what my favorite book, favorite movie, or favorite food was. Or rather, he was making something up. It was obvious that he was just trying to guess. For example, he said that I loved risotto with mushrooms. And I don't even like rice. Okay, I've lost my memory, but my taste shouldn't have changed so drastically. Did you voice your suspicions to him? Yes. He assured me it was a result of the trauma. He told me that I had been hit by a car while crossing the street in the wrong place and that the driver left the scene. It was very strange and suspicious. And then there was that look in his eyes. What look? The psychologist did not understand. Fussy, nervous, rushing, like he is a criminal. A husband doesn't look at his wife like that. And then there was not a single picture of us together. There were no my clothes, nothing that belonged to me. There were not even feminine hygiene products or cosmetics. There was absolutely nothing that reminded me of our past life with him. Did he have an explanation for that too? The psychologist asked. Oh, yes, he was always very clever, Rokelia grinned. He said that when I got in an accident, the doctors were afraid I was going to die and they didn't give any prognosis. 
and out of grief, he destroyed everything that would remind him of me, including photo albums. He said it was too painful for him to look at pictures of us together. But I still didn't believe him. He told me about our wedding, about some trips we had taken together, about our time together. I honestly tried to remember anything he told me, but I couldn't. My mind was a complete blank. Well, then, if I really was in such a severe condition, why didn't I have a bruise or a scratch on my body? And did you ask him about your family and friends? The psychologist intervened again. Of course, I did. He told me that I had a bad relationship with my parents, we quarreled and hadn't spoken for a long time. And after we got married, we moved to another city, and since then I haven't seen my parents. And about my friends, he said that I had no friends at all because his company was always enough for me. But it's just impossible that I had no family, no friends, or at least no colleagues. Rokelia's voice rang with indignation. What else did you ask him? The psychologist continued. I asked if we have children. He said no, because I didn't want and, in general, I don't like children. But I, deep in my heart I know, I feel that I love children very much and I definitely wanted to have children. I really couldn't have changed that much. How did your relationship develop after that? The psychologist asked. Our relationship was like I was a prisoner and he was the warden. He controlled my every step and wouldn't let me leave the house. I could only get some fresh air on the balcony and only together with him. I felt like a prisoner. He said he was terribly worried about losing me again and therefore tried to protect me from further accidents. He wouldn't even let me use the phone. He wouldn't let me use the internet. He wouldn't tell me the Wi-Fi password. He assured me that the doctors forbade it. But I felt he was lying. Listening to all of this, Sebastian only clenched his fists in helpless rage. Bastard. What a bastard he is. He muttered to himself. He did not know who the bastard was who had kidnapped his wife. But he was sure that if he ever met this Gilberto, this bastard would be in trouble. However, he was convinced it was not his real name since he had even lied to Rokelia that her name was Felicia. The recording of the conversation with the psychologist continued. What did he look like? What was his last name? He didn't tell me his last name, just Gilberto. And he didn't show me any documents, neither our marriage certificate nor my or his passport, nothing. He looked average, average height, about 30 years old, blonde hair, blue eyes. No special features. How was your life organized? Every morning, except weekends, he'd lock me in the house and leave for work. He'd come back late at night. I watched TV all day long. I had no other entertainment anyway. Did he try to have intimacy with you as a spouse? The psychologist asked cautiously. Of course. I refused for as long as possible. But soon he began to express his discontent. He said it was my duty, that I had no right to refuse him, and eventually I had to give up. I felt nothing with him, nothing. I just closed my eyes every time and endured. I endured and hated him with all my heart. Sebastian couldn't take it anymore and paused the tape. His heart was literally bursting with pain. Listening to such confessions was insanely hard. He took a cognac from the bar, poured himself half a glass, and drank it in a gulp without even wincing. Only after that Sebastian was able to turn on the video again. I was planning my escape, Rokelia continued. Living with this man was absolutely unbearable. I didn't know where to go, but the main thing was not to stay with him. One day he was in a hurry, being late for work, and he forgot to lock the door. I couldn't believe my luck, so I ran outside, just as I was, no clothes, no money. I wanted to run away, but he came back halfway through, remembering that the door was unlocked. He dragged me inside, by the scruff of my neck like a dog. He was furious. Did he beat you? The psychologist cautiously asked. Physically, no, but every day, every second he threatened me and killed me emotionally. He humiliated me, trampled me in the mud, told me for hours what an ungrateful wife I was, and told me that I was nobody. 
He told me that he did everything for me, and I spat in his soul. This abuse went on daily, minute by minute. I began to think about suicide. Life was no fun for me. Day after day, month after month, year after year. I was slowly dying in my prison. How did you manage to escape? The psychologist asked. I outsmarted him, Rokelia answered. I started to complain that I do not sleep well. He promised to get me sleeping pills. I lied to him that I took the pills regularly, but I hid them under the mattress. When I had enough pills, I just slipped them into his tea. When he fell asleep and snored, I ran away. Why didn't you go to the police? The psychologist asked. At first, I wanted to, but then I got scared. Who would believe me? No money, no documents, no memory, some suspicious person. And I was also very afraid that the police would somehow find Gilberto and make me go back to him. It must have been stupid, but at the time I was thinking about nothing but freedom. I took some money from him, but it was not enough. And I was afraid to take my phone. He could use it to get my location. For a few days, I just wandered the streets, buying bread and water, and sleeping on benches in parks. And then, then I met this man, Sebastian. Do you trust him? The psychologist asked. Rokelia was quiet for a while, and Sebastian tensed up, waiting for an answer. Rather, yes, he seems honest to me. I really wish I could remember him. He seems to be a very nice man, and his daughter is wonderful. I swear I'll find that bastard, Rokelia. Sebastian promised in a whisper, looking at the laptop screen. Whoever and wherever he was, he would pay for everything he did. The days went on and on. They all had fun celebrating Ada's birthday together. The daughter happily informed everyone that her mother was back. All their friends and acquaintances were shocked. Sebastian was quietly making new documents for Rokelia. They went to the police several times to testify. The police tried to find this scoundrel but to no avail. And there wasn't much chance of finding him. No description, no last name, no address. Little by little, Rokelia stopped being afraid of Sebastian and began to get used to him. She found common ground with Ada even faster. From the outside, they looked like a real family again, just like before. But Sebastian was not satisfied with that. He wanted Rokelia to have more than feelings of gratitude for him. He wished that she would love him again, the way she had loved him before. To help awaken her memories, he talked a lot with Rokelia about their past, as a psychologist recommended. The doctors assured him that the memory could return at any time, it just needed some kind of trigger. Sebastian remembered some funny incidents from their past, took Rokelia to their favorite places in the city, they went to their favorite cafes. And, by the way, Sebastian knew for a fact that her favorite meal was grilled salmon. One day he took an old school photo album out of his desk drawer. He showed it to Rokelia, named all their classmates and teachers, and flipped through the pages. Suddenly Rokelia held his hand and exhaled hoarsely. Stop. He looked at her, frightened, she had turned so pale. What happened, my love? He asked worriedly. It's him. She said, pointing her finger at one of the pictures of the school graduation. Who? Sebastian didn't understand. Gilberto. My fake husband. Sebastian shifted his gaze to the picture she was showing. He thought he was going crazy. Are you sure? He asked in a tense voice. Absolutely, Rokelia exhaled with hatred. I'll never forget that face. Arturo Flores looked at them from the picture, smiling merrily. The puzzle formed in Sebastian's mind instantly. He remembered how Flores had tried to hit on Rokelia and how she had turned him down. He also remembered that strange encounter in the store a year after Rokelia had gone missing and everyone had thought she was dead. He had seen Arturo with a shopping cart that contained some female stuff. Some kind of cosmetics, either cream or scrub. Sebastian also clearly recalled the strange way Arturo had behaved when he saw him as if he had been terribly frightened, immediately leaving his shopping cart and running out of the store. 
Apparently, at that time Rokilio was already living with him, trapped as if in a cage, and Arturo was very afraid that someone would find out about it. Sebastian immediately went to the police. A couple of hours later Arturo Flores had already been taken out of his house in handcuffs. He faced up to 12 years imprisonment for kidnapping, and even the connections of his parents did not help. At the trial, Arturo cried, apologized, and asked forgiveness from Roquilia, Sebastian, and their daughter Ada. He said that high school love had long been an obsession for him, a painful passion that he had never been able to overcome. He even went to the same university, hoping to get closer to her. But she didn't pay any attention to him and married Sebastian. That day Arturo really happened to meet her on the street, and she was really hit by a car. But only it was his car. He stared at Roquilia at a crosswalk and didn't have time to slow down, as if he had fallen into hypnosis. Arturo rushed to Roquilia's aid, taking her to a private clinic. When he found out that she had lost her memory and didn't recognize anyone, he was even relieved that he didn't have to face the responsibility for hitting her in the crosswalk. He didn't have his fake wife's ID, so he just paid the doctors generously for their silence. The situation turned out to be beneficial for Arturo, Roquilia remembered nothing. This was a real gift to him and a dream of his life. He really believed that from that day on he and Roquilia would begin a new, long, and happy life. However, he was wrong. No matter how hard he tried, Roquilia never accepted him as her lover, she never fell in love with him. Days, weeks, and months passed. Roquilia still remembered nothing, but Sebastian just waited patiently. He waited that someday she would remember how much she loved him, and he was willing to wait indefinitely, as long as it took. One warm Sunday afternoon, the whole family went to the park, they ate ice cream, rode the rides, and laughed merrily. They looked like a perfectly happy and harmonious family. Suddenly, Sebastian felt nervous. He saw his parents walking toward them in the alley. They hadn't spoken in years, hadn't called each other. And now he was clearly not ready to meet them. They also looked confused and a little embarrassed. Hello, son, his father said awkwardly. Hello, father, Sebastian said. Sebastian, we know everything. We have been informed that Roquilia has been found. What a joy. We are so happy. Maybe you will finally introduce us to our granddaughter? His mother asked timidly. But Sebastian did not have time to answer. Suddenly, Roquilia's calm and cold voice came out. Granddaughter? Seriously? You finally remembered that you happened to have a granddaughter? After all these years? Sebastian stared at Roquilia with his eyes wide open. He hadn't told her about his complicated relationship with his parents so as not to worsen her condition with unnecessary stress. But how did she find out? Roquilia, he asked cautiously. Do you know why Ada still hasn't met her grandparents? Roquilia looked at him oddly. Strange question. Of course, I know. Because your parents can't stand me and consider me an unworthy plebeian who has seduced their only son. Roquilia. Sebastian whispered, not believing his happiness. When is our wedding day? The 2nd of July, she said quickly. Why are you asking me all these silly questions? You have your memory back, he said quietly, looking at her with his eyes wide open. Roquilia rounded her eyes. Memory? Why should my memory come back to me? Am I an old granny to lose it? I remember everything. And he picked her up in his arms and spun her around like a merry-go-round, shouting excitedly. Hooray! Hooray! Your memory has returned to you. Let me go, crazy man. Roquilia said, laughing. All the people are looking at us. But he didn't care. He was happy because he was holding his beloved, inimitable wife in his arms again, and they would certainly live happily ever after. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.